you may know that the number one thing that couples argue about is money. Um, and it's also the thing that, that couples have the toughest time, in my view, talking about uh, openly, you know, in our world, uh, money topics are taboo. You know, we're very private about our money, uh, even when it comes to relationships. And when you start dating, oftentimes you're trying to court somebody and maybe you're paying for dates and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's usually not first date material, you know, uh, what your credit score is. So All right, Aaron Thomas, uh, Feel Good Fathers, let's welcome him. He is a divorce, uh, sorry, a family law, uh, family lawyer, and uh, owner of prenups.com. So what is a prenup? What is a postnup? What do we got to know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and thanks for starting off with this question, because I think even just the question of what is a prenup is often misunderstood. Um, you know, in my view, a prenup is a plan for how a couple will handle, handle their finances um, during the marriage itself, as well as what happens uh, to their finances um, in the event that the relationship uh, dissolves at some point. Uh, I think the point that is often um, misunderstood is a lot of people think of a prenup as simply just a plan for divorce. You know, what happens if the relationship doesn't work out? Um, and what I've found is that being clear about how you stand in terms of your money, um, a husband and a wife, uh, can really dictate the health of their relationship. You know, if you lack transparency in your finances during the marriage, you're probably, you know, lacking transparency in other areas. You know, if you're not communicating about your finances, uh, in your marriage, then that lack of communication probably bleeds over into other areas of your relationship. So um, when I think about a prenup, I think about, you know, planning a couple's financial relationship, um, putting that couple on the path for success. And, you know, a healthy financial relationship helps towards, you know, a healthy overall marital relationship. What are some examples of, let's take a look at uh, some some examples. I, I think I'd like to hit the the majority of the social economic spectrum. And so um, when you're talking about somebody that gets a prenup, actually, yeah, this will be a better question to start. When you're talking about somebody that's getting a prenup, uh, in general, that has a, a specific fee. So what kind of what kind of social economic world are you living in where you're actually getting a prenup? Like who, who are your typical clients? Yeah, our typical clients are um, uh, first time couples getting married, uh, late 20s to 30s. Um, a lot of people think that, you know, prenups are only for the ultra wealthy, um, but that's really not the case. You know, a lot of times we're talking about uh, young professionals, um, people who may not have tons of money, but, you know, maybe they've got, you know, 10, 20,000 in a retirement account. They've got a little bit of equity uh, in a condo or in their first home. Um, they may have some savings. They've got a, they've got a vehicle, you know, um, a little brokerage account. We're not usually talking about millions of dollars. Um, we're talking about somebody who's who's typically at the beginning stages of their financial journey. Got it. And so to translate that, everyone, <laughs> so, <laughs> right? Everyone that's pretty much, married. yeah, pretty, pretty much everyone, you know, I, when I think of a prenup, I think about a financial plan for, you know, managing your finances. So, uh, who doesn't need that, you know, when you're getting right. married. Exactly. Exactly. And I know uh, in this world, right, the, the thing that is the most messy, uh, well, you know what? Actually, I don't. And let me clarify that. I don't know what the divorce world looks like. I don't. I'm not, I'm not divorced myself, happily married for um, at this stage uh, around uh, 13 years. So there's that piece. Um, none of my colleagues are, are in this world. My parents were, but I was too young to understand all that kind of stuff. Um, this financial separation. Right. This can cause like, let, let's talk about what this looks like when it's messy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, I, you know, congratulations on, on 13 years of marriage. Thank I, you. Um, you know, kind of in the same boat. Uh, I have not been divorced. Uh, I'm happily married. Uh, my parents just celebrated 56 years in August. So, Congrats um, to them. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, pro divorce by any means. Um, but I know that it's the unfortunate reality that a lot of people face. And um, you may know that the number one thing that couples argue about is money. Mm 
Um, and it's also the thing that that couples have the toughest time, in my view, talking about uh, openly, you know, in our world, uh, money topics are taboo. You know, we're very private about our money, uh, even when it comes to relationships. And when you start dating, oftentimes you're trying to court somebody and maybe you're paying for dates and, <laughs> you know, it's, it's usually not first date material, you know, uh, what your credit score is, a card. And I find that a lot of times couples get married and they've never had that conversation about, you know, this is, these are my financial habits. This is how much debt I'm bringing in. This is what I think a healthy savings rate is, you know, um, much less do they get down to, you know, private school or public school, you know, those kinds of things. And so um, when couples do not get aligned uh, financially, those problems tend to grow over time. Um, and when those couples relationships fail and they've got to dissolve, uh, their finances, you know, as well as their relationship, um, it can get really messy um, because, you know, you're not just putting all of the assets and debts in a pile and splitting them up. You're kind of bringing up these festering problems that were growing throughout the entire relationship. Mm. Um, and, uh, and it all comes to a head, you know, uh, oftentimes in the courtroom um, in ways that don't benefit either party. Got it. Okay. Prenup is a solid, positive financial plan uh, when the worst case happens for your marriage. So what what does it mean for the day to day? Like what the, there, the there's two worlds, right? Get a prenup, get it in writing, you know, uh, uh, be serious about about the day to day operations of your marriage. And then there's the, you know, let, let's talk about this world. What? what does this day-to-day -day world look like? What does this present present case look like? Why, why bother with a prenup? Like, what is it going to help you do? Right. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, in, in other words, what are the benefits of a prenup if you're not headed towards divorce? I mean, how does it benefit your actual marriage? Um, and uh, there's a few ways. I mean, the, the first way is in that initial transparency, um, you know, for a prenuptial agreement to be enforceable in pretty much all 50 States in the U S uh, both spouses have to disclose all of their assets and debts to each other. And the way that we ensure that this happens is we will literally attach a schedule for each spouse to the back of the agreement that lists out all of their assets and debts. It's kind of like a personal net worth statement for each spouse. Um, and so uh, a lot of times what we'll find is couples have discussed their financial status at least vaguely with each other. But often this is the first time where they're seeing in black and white, you know, this is my net worth. This is how much I owe on my car. This is how much equity I've got in my house. Um, this is how much I'm saving for retirement. And so um, providing that opportunity for the couple to be transparent about those things uh, is really important. Um, you know, another thing <laughs> that I like to say is, you know, couples are often more comfortable being physically naked with each other than they are being fiscally naked with each other. Um, and so this could be a good opportunity to kind of, you know, break down that wall and make sure that um, both couple, both spouses disclose all of their assets and debts when they get married. And the hope is they continue to have that transparency as the relationship moves forward. Um, I think the second thing that we try to do is um, set up the correct kind of money buckets. And so, you know, deciding, you know, who owns what um, in a marriage is beneficial to the marriage. You don't have to be in the state where you're splitting up your assets for it to be important to decide, you know, who owns what. A lot of times people get married and, and um, they either go one of two ways. They either say everything we own is jointly together. You know, it's one big pile, but that's not really true, right? I mean, right. my cell phone belongs to me. You know, it doesn't belong to both me and my spouse. My wife's, my wife's laptop belongs to her. It's not my laptop. So, you know, recognizing that we've really got three buckets of money. We've got mine, we've got hers, and we've got ours. And putting things in those correct buckets, um, I think tends to clear up, you know, well, what's my responsibility? You know, you had that condo before we got married. So if something goes wrong with it, should we pay for that from the joint account? Should you pay from it from your separate money? Should I contribute to it from my separate money? Um, and being clear on, you know, where the lines are drawn between mine, yours, and ours can help um, eliminate some of those arguments before they start. 
So um, I think that is another way that, um, you know, kind of us writing down, you know, who owns what in a prenuptial agreement can be helpful for the marriage itself. And then a third major way is we try to write into all of our prenuptial agreements uh, this idea of like an annual meeting. Uh, we like to call it the shareholders meeting. Um, and so um, there's a number of things that um, should be discussed by couples on an ongoing basis. But again, because we're typically not good in our society about talking about money, a lot of times they go unsaid. And so couples, you know, I've, I've done cases, you know, unfortunate divorce cases where people have been married 20, 30 years, and they come to me and say, I have no idea what he has. I have no idea what she owns because we just never talked about those things. I, I, you know, I think they do well, but I've never actually seen their W-2s. I don't know how much they earn. Um, and having this idea of an annual meeting where you sit down and you've got a set time every year where you say, okay, we're going to put out our incomes on the table. We're going to put all of our debts on the table, you know, whether something is in my name or your name or it's in joint names. Let's sit down. Let's have a time to talk about the state of our finances. You know, what, what were the big surprises from this back this past year? You know, were there any expenses that we weren't prepared for? What are we expecting this upcoming year? Are we, is one of us going to change jobs? Is someone thinking about going back to school? Do we have, you know, are we expecting a child this year? And we got expenses associated with that. You know, are we going to move? Are we doing a relocation? Um, and having a set time for couples to discuss a certain list of financial things um, can be a huge help to couples that otherwise wouldn't be having these conversations and these little resentments and problems kind of breathe in the background. So mm. those are just a few examples of things that we try to do to promote the health of the rela of the relationship. What are some examples that you've seen that make sense to share about um houses that have done very well with a prenup relationships that have been very either lopsided or unhealthy that this this kind of prenup has has fixed what are the kind of stresses that we can unwittingly put on our spouses as feel good fathers uh what what are some examples we can learn and glean from your experience yeah yeah so one example that i see come up over and over is um you know in today's day and age couples are getting married later in life. You know, my parents' generation, people got married straight out of high school or they were, you know, 20, 21. Um, people in our generation are more likely to get married for the first time between ages 28 and 30. So they're a little bit further along in life. And so often um, one or both spouses will already own their first home or they've got a condo and one person is moving into the other spouse's property um, and figuring out what that looks like and who owns what can be super important so that you don't have a situation where, for example, you know, you'll often have couples where they're living in a house that's in one spouse's name, but the other spouse is paying kind of rent to that spouse. And so it kind of feels like is the equity that's coming, getting, you know, that's growing in this property, is that ours? Is that shared equity? Or does that just belong to you? Am I am I paying rent? Are you my landlord <laughs> or, or my right. spouse here? You know, and getting some clarity on what that relationship looks like, you know, in, you know, in a prenup or a postnup can be can be big, um, not just for clarifying, you know, who owns what if it gets split up, but somebody is moving into their spouse's property. You know, if you're going to repaint a room, you know, do I have a say? You know, if I've moved into my wife's property, do I have a say on whether we renovate this room or not? You know, um, you know, if, if the hot water heater busts, is that your responsibility because the house is owned by you? Or is that a joint responsibility because the house is owned by both of us? Um, and so, um, you know, do you put your spouse's name on the property and it becomes a joint property? And if so, you know, are we writing out that the first, you know, X amount of equity belongs to you and everything over that is shared? So these are some of the you know, issues that couples can run into um, that can be sticky if you are not working with someone who has dealt with these kinds of issues before. And so often we'll help you know, couples navigate. You know, that's just one example of a very common issue that couples may have. Got it. Got it. Okay. What about, um, uh, what about how it impacts the actual relationship? So we've, we've got this world where... Um, we know it's, it's difficult to share financial details. Uh, there's a, for, as you're saying, it's, uh, 
more comfortable to get naked than than being fiscally naked with each other. And right. so what 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 shows up like once this happens, like what what do you see in the relationship? What do you see in the marriage? I think that it can help couples get on a more um, even footing with each other. Um, I think that couples will sometimes unwittingly or unknowingly create unhealthy power dynamics in their relationships by the way they treat their money. For example, um, uh, I worked with a couple where uh, the husband was working and the wife was staying home and raising their children. And the wife had left uh, a pretty lucrative career to you know, take on this role as the homemaker in the household. The husband, he was earning over 200 grand uh, a year. And when the wife left her job to come home, the husband, all of his income went into an account in his name uh, that the wife couldn't see, didn't have any access to. And he gave her an allowance of $300 a month while she was home with the kids. And so you had two couple, two spouses living in a house in different socioeconomic brackets where he's living, you know, high on the hog and can buy and, you know, pay for whatever he wants. And the wife was basically destitute and had to essentially go and, you know, practically beg for spending money to be able to get clothes or things beyond groceries for the kids. And so um, being able to help couples like that step back and, you know, look at, hey, you guys are in this together and, you know, let's have, you know, money sit in a joint account that mm -hmm. is accessible by both of you, or let's give both of you, you know, quote unquote allowance every month, but have those numbers be equal so that we're valuing, you know, she's forfeited a career to stay home and raise, you know, children. You are contributing to the relationship by going to the work every day. You're both contributing to the relationship and you should both be, you know, sharing in the fruits of the relationship, whether that's, you know, financial or, or otherwise. So, mm. um, you know, it's another way that, you know, I think couples will sometimes um, set themselves up for trouble, uh, not seeing it, um, that we can help them, help them navigate. Got it. So what we're the goal of this, so the goal of the, well, a societal goal for prenups is to take that which is hidden and put it into light. So take something that people are keeping private, that they're embarrassed about or they have poor habits around that um, legitimately do have an, a, a real and tangible impact on their spouse and make that a joint discussion, make it transparent, right? So that's the purpose of this, this agreement, this prenup. Great. I'm a feel, feel good father. I'm married. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there, there is the idea of, of, postnuptial agreements. Um, and they are permitted in, in 49 out of the 50 states. We just had Ohio get on board. And so uh, we think it's only a matter of time before Iowa uh, joins the movement. But um, in most states, you can get uh, a postnuptial agreement. Um, and those can sometimes take different forms. You know, a lot of times we'll do postnups that are, you know, somebody just didn't get around to getting something signed prior to the marriage. They intended to do a prenup and we're doing a post enough that's just sold a prenup that's done a little bit too late. And other times we're coming in and we're fixing some of these problems that we're talking about where there's some inequity on the home front or, uh, you know, the couple hasn't decided, you know, what money is going to go in what buckets and who's going to have access to what. Um, and we'll come in or, you know, the house situation that I was talking about and we'll come in and, you know, let's trade the ideas. Let's trade these, assumptions for structured conversations. Um, you know, another example of something that, you know, could help a, a married couple. And so in a lot of these principles, it doesn't matter whether you go get a written agreement or not. You know, a lot of these principles can help couples who, you know, are not going to a lawyer's office to sign a document. Um, but, uh, you know, one example of, of, you know, getting on the same page with your finances is, Say you've got one spouse working and that spouse is contributing to, you know, a 401k. Say the husband's working, he's contributing, he's maxing out his 401k. The wife is not working. And so there are no retirement benefits or no retirement accounts that are growing that are in her name alone. Um, a, a question that couples should answer is, does that retirement account belong to the couple? Or does it just belong to that spouse in whose name the, the account is, is listed? 
And what I've found is a lot of times it's during a divorce case itself that the wife says, I always assumed that that was our nest egg, that that was being grown for us. And the husband says, I was the one working. I was the one contributing to that account. Shouldn't that belong to me? And what I realized in my practice is that problem doesn't just crop up. It doesn't just become an issue during the divorce case. That's an issue of communication during the marriage itself. Mm -hmm. You know, if one spouse is working and is, is growing this empire and is growing this estate, if the non-working spouse knows that that belongs to the both of them, they may be a little bit more forgiving if you got to work late. You know, they may be a little bit more, more forgiving if you got to, you know, go in on a Saturday or Sunday because you know you're growing something that is for the family. It's for all of us. Whereas if one spouse believes that, you know, this this business or this bank account or this retirement account just belongs to me and the other spouse assumes that it belongs to both of them, whether they have that specific argument out loud or not, that is going to cause a problem. Those resentments, uh, those miscommunications, um, they cause issues in the background, whether they're on the table or not. So, yes, absolutely. I'm all about let's put it on the table. Let's talk about it. You know, what is the plan here? What is joint? Uh, what is separate? Um, and, uh, you know, th these kinds of principles, transparency, communication, fairness, um, those are the principles that we think are at the heart of all of our agreements. And I think that non-coincidentally, they're at the heart of healthy marital relationships in general. Got it. Got it. So we've, we really, we've summed up this expertise in, in communication. Like that's really this core, this core principle, this core idea. So how does that show up for you um, in your marriage? How does that show up for you as a father? Uh, you know, how are you taking this value, this principle of clear, transparent communication uh, and then leading into planning, but how this principle of communication, how is that showing up for you? Um, I think, you know, the biggest thing was my wife and I, and, you know, we're going on this April will be seven years for us. Um, Congrats. And thank you. And um, uh, getting transparent at the beginning of our relationship was something, you know, really healthy. You know, we did the, uh, the premarital counseling that a lot of us do um, and noticed that, you know, we spent, uh, a full day with the young lady who ran our session. And we talked a lot about the emotional sides of the relationship and, you know, how we felt about our extended family and, you know, even our sex lives and didn't touch finances one single time. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that it's something, it's a missed opportunity. It's something that's lacking in a lot of premarital conversations for us laying out our finances, you know, at the beginning with each other, um, was healthy, uh, deciding, you know, how our income was going to flow into our accounts um, and, you know, agreeing that, you know, we we're both going to have an allowance that we got every month, but that they were going to be equal amounts. Um, and so, um, you know, my wife has her own money. I've got my own money. We can both spend how we want without oversight, you know, of the other party. But we also have this mutual respect where if we're going to spend something from the joint account, we have a rule in our relationship that, um, you know, if we're going to spend more than a couple hundred bucks from the joint account that we check in with the other spouse before we do it. Um, and it's not, you know, an issue of uh, asking permission from each other. Um, it is just kind of a, a mutual respect that we've built into our relationship. And I, I believe that, you know, because we have put in these communication rules in place that it bleeds into other areas of our relationship, you know, that our default is let's talk to the other one about it. You know, that's our, that's our rule of mutual respect. I'm, I'm imagining all those different football movies where uh, the quarterback or the coach is trying to get the teams to run the same plays. And it's like, you've got like the QB on the field and they're in practice and half of the, half of the, the offensive team thinks they're doing a running play. Then the other half thinks they're doing like a passing play and like the chaos that occurs. And I was just like, just, I, I think of the, the spouse's, they're they're running different plays on the same battle on the same battlefield listen to that uh the football <laughs> the football warriors charging down the down the field right uh um i was a flanker wide, wide receiver by the way um you know you hit your whole team's running a different play 
and uh, it doesn't work. It's chaos. Um, uh, you, you can't make any progress in that way. Um, that's, that's really interesting. Um, I really like that. The other part was this, this concept you had of communication. And so what I think was, is really interesting is that and feel good father a, a handful of times, we've talked about this idea that when you are making decisions or when you're communicating, sometimes you're communicating, sometimes your spouse is communicating. And sometimes their relationship is communicating. Another way to phrase that is sometimes you're making a decision, sometimes they're making a decision, and sometimes the decision is made for the relationship or the relationship makes the decision. And so there's this, uh, what I really liked was that there was this really nice parity in this model of the financial buckets where both parties have an account that they're free on and then both parties have their relationship account. Um, and it kind of forces that mutual uh, come back that planning, that tactical decisions, the day-to-day -day operations, et cetera, all that kind of jazz. Um, listen to me in all this military and football language. It's crazy. Get me off of this. Help me, Aaron. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so now we've got um, this idea that we like this communication. You know, it's it's really for the the health and uh, mental well-being. Uh, there's a power dynamic. You know, power dynamics create. Uh, you know, subservience, power, this kind of jazz. It's it's all like there's emotional, mental, spiritual, everything's going on here. All right, so that's happening. Now let's talk a little bit about the planning side. What's the strategic long-term view of having these either financial conversations and what, what that does for the marriage? How does that look? And then what does it look like um, on the mechanical day-to-day -day, uh, having these agreements? You know, we'll come back to our nuptial stuff, the pre and post nup. What does that mean? Like, how is that structured? What? I have no idea about any of this stuff. Like, you're you're making me want to talk to you about getting a post up. So I'm like, <laughs> uh, what does it look like? You know, let's let's tell feel good fathers what 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 happens here. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, when it comes to you know having these annual meetings and you know structuring the communication, one thing that uh, I'll tell couples to do is decide who the CFO is of the relationship. Um, and, uh, most couples, even without me describing it anymore, can point to the person who they know is going to be the CFO. You know, there's, there's one person who's more likely to have, you know, everything in spreadsheets, or, you know, if you ask somebody to, you know, tell you what their net worth is, there are some people who they can pull it up on their phone in their, you know, financial app, you know, within a few seconds, and there are other people who would have to go reset some passwords, you know, for old retirement accounts, you know, old 401ks they haven't rolled over yet. And so you for decide, the, you know, just super quick for the feel good fathers that aren't quite aware, uh, chief financial officer. Uh, and in yes. general, um, this is the person that has the most financial know how the one that is the most comfortable with numbers, uh, the one that has the, uh, in the financial education, budgets, investments, et cetera. Uh, some of us have uh, a talent for this. Some of us don't. It's okay wherever you're at. Please continue, Aaron. <laughs> right, right. No, perfect. Thank you for that. And and so the you know the kind of the idea of the CFO is they're not just the person who makes all the decisions unilaterally. They don't lord over the entire corporation. You know, the entire company that is your marriage. They are. They have a responsibility to the shareholders. You know, and so when I talk about a shareholder meeting, the CFO's role is to come and explain, you know, to lay bare the finances of the company to the shareholders. And so in the relationship, the person who, you know, is the CFO, they're the accountant. They're they're adding up the numbers and they're coming back and reporting, you know, this is our savings rate. You know, these were our big expenses. This is our budget. This is how close we're sticking to our budget. You know, this is the proposed budget for next year. But it's it's the shareholders, it's the couple that votes on the, you know, on the final proposals that are going to get implemented for, you know, the upcoming year. Um, you know, one thing that I found, you know, working with couples over the years is uh, if people don't have enough saved for retirement, it's very easy for couples to kind of point at the other one and say, well, oh, well, you know, you know, he's doing all the spending or, you know, she wasn't, you know, saving enough for retirement. And a lot of it, I think, stems from a lack of communication about these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. If you have a set time every year and on your annual checklist is talk about retirement contributions for the upcoming year, then those things can't go skipped. You know, you can't say that you didn't contribute to your retirement accounts um, just because of lack of inertia, because you've got a checklist item that you're coming back to at least once a year and saying, 
all right, what are we going to save for retirement? So if you're not contributing to your 401k or if you're not maxing out, then it's because it was a an open decision that was jointly made by the couple not to contribute. Or if you're contributing X percent, that was something that was discussed openly and a decision that was made and not something you look up in 20 years and say, I thought you were taking care of this. You know, or oh, I thought you were saving. I thought you were the one that was, you know, saving for retirement. At least it's not going to sneak up on you and happen by accident. So, so it's this this concept of this. It's a joint and personal responsibility, right? We're taking responsibility for ourselves. We're taking responsibility for our actions. We're taking responsibility for having the conversation, which is also critical in all areas of your of your marriage. Um, and that's that's the significant piece here. Is that. Uh, when you oh, when yeah. you say you can't point fingers, you're owning it. You're you're bringing it into your life. Okay, wonderful. What else? Um, and so that and then budgeting, right? So if if the CFO is coming in and you know these apps these days like Mint.com or you need a budget or a personal capital, um, there's a lot. There's a there's a bunch of websites that allow you to kind of track and tally your finances and. Uh, a lot of them have this functionality where you can see what percentage of your spending went to what categories. Mm -hmm. So how much did you spend on groceries last year versus eating out versus travel versus, you know, rent and mortgage home expenses. And when you look back on the year, uh, one question that it's good to ask yourself is, did my spending match my values? You know, if you find that you're spending, you know, if you say that you value travel, for example, um, but, you know, your travel spending from last year, you know, didn't crack 1%, but you're spending, you know, 12% of your budget eating out, does, does your values match what you're actually doing in real life? And, you know, does that give you an opportunity to kind of course correct for the upcoming year and set aside, you know, so for example, my wife and I travel is our big thing. And so we have an agreement that we're setting aside at a minimum 3% of our income every year for travel expenses mm -hmm. so that when we want to take a trip, we don't have the excuse of, oh, the money's not there or we can't afford it or we'll try again next year. No, we have put that in the forefront and said, this is something that we're going to set aside money for. You know, for some couples, that's a child fund or the new house or the mm -hmm. new car for somebody. So, mm -hmm. you know, just, just having an opportunity to talk about what is important to us, what are our financial goals? Do we have something that's shared that we can work towards? And then let's make an intentional plan to work towards that, that shared goal. You say set aside. And so back in the day, um, so I'm more of the, the CFO of the family. Uh, we were both on Simple. Simple was this older bank, uh, not old, actually older bank is not correct. It shut down a little bit ago because of some other reasons, but it was a bank where you could have a checking and savings account and you could within the app of the bank allocate buckets and so when the cash came in you could have you would have you would have the total amount so you could say well ten thousand dollars there's ten thousand dollars in this account however allocation wise a thousand bucks is for groceries you know two thousand bucks is for travel uh two thousand bucks is for mortgage and we'll just stop there on the example so right all this is going on and what would happen is that you could allocate what came out of the account to one of those buckets so if it was two thousand bucks for your mortgage um what would happen is that it would be more like a i don't even know what to call it it's not a thermometer it's not the concept i'm thinking of but it's like it's this oh it's like a cup it's like this cup and the cup gets full and then while it's full it's good it says there's two thousand dollars in it and then when it depletes based on your spending it goes down then when the money comes back in it gets reallocated to that bucket so you always have this concept of, and what they use was this idea of safe to spend. So this is the, in the grand scheme of things, it, it never, it, the system would never say, no, you cannot spend from this account in modern bank accounts worlds, but you at least had a concept of, I have this much money that's safe to spend. These are my buckets. So like the bills are taken care of. This is what's the fun stuff. Um, it's a system, uh, Whoever, whoever made simple, if you hear this, I would love for this to exist. I don't know why it doesn't exist. If you could find a simpler business model and reinstitute it, it helped so many people. Uh, that financial education was great. However, that does not exist today. It's, it's not as easy to set up these buckets and to do all this kind of jazz. So what systems, tools, tools do you use or would you suggest 
where people can create these buckets, do this allocation as you're talking about. Allocation meaning you have a certain amount of the money coming in that is uh, put into another bucket. Uh, what what would you suggest, um, you know, from your perspective, or what do you use personally that would help our feel good fathers out there? Yeah. So. Um... Great question. I'm glad you asked this. And and I'll tell you what my wife and I do. So um, there's kind of two ways, two main ways that people will set up their money buckets in our system. One is the inside out plan and the other is the outside in plan. In the inside out plan, which my wife and I use, all of the income goes into our joint account mm -hmm. uh, initially. And then from that, we each get our allowance. So she gets her allowance from that at the beginning of the month. I get my allowance from that at the beginning of the month. And we can spend that money on whatever we want. So I could save 90% of my allowance. She can spend 100% of her allowance if she wanted. And that would be totally fine because it doesn't impact the other person. And this, by the way, is kind of the gold nugget advice that I give to couples when they say, one of us is a spender and one of us is a saver please help us. <laughs> you know, what do we do? Um, because if all of your spending is happening from this joint account, then the person who was the saver is watching the money deplete, you know, day after day throughout the month. And it is driving them, them crazy saying, you know, they're spending up all the money. And what happens sometimes is the saver spouse then feels like I've got to keep up or there's not going to be any money for me to for me to spend at the end of the month. So then they start spending more and it becomes this arms race where they're left with, you know, a negative balance at the end of every month because they're both trying to keep up with, you know, the spending of each other. And there's this there's this rule that happens in relationships where if each spouse is spending 50 percent of the money, it feels like the other spouse is spending 70 percent. Ah. <laughs> if you're spending the exact same amounts, your own spending is almost invisible to you, but your spouse's spending is very top of mind, you know, yeah. when you see yep. it come out of the account. Okay. And so the way that we address that in our relationship is the only things that come out of the joint account are those expenses that are truly joint. So okay. if we go out to eat together, it comes from the joint account. If we get groceries, it comes out of the joint account. Our, our daughter's expenses come out of the joint account. But if I'm going out to eat and I'm not with my wife, then that comes out of my separate account or my clothing expenses, or even, you know, going to get a haircut that comes out of my separate account so that there's never, you know, a debate of, or, you know, well, why did you spend that much money on that? Um, or, you know, I can't believe, you know, you purchased that, you know, we could have got it for so much cheaper. Um, and it's, it's the best way to handle these things because if there's ever a dispute, my wife would just say, oh, I'll just get it from my money. <laughs> so that we can short circuit the debate. And there's nothing I can say about that because, you know, she's got her own allocation and, and I've got mine. So I'd say, you know, getting the general idea is get the money out of the account and into the separate buckets as quickly as possible before money can be spent. And just to circle back, the outside in plan, the other version is where money comes into uh, the couples, each spouse's separate accounts first, and they contribute to the joint account. Mm -hmm. Uh, agreed upon amounts or agreed upon percentages. So a very common way to do that is um, you say you've got one spouse who makes 60 grand a year and you got another spouse who makes 40 grand a year. Well, typically the spouse who makes 60 grand will contribute, you know, and say they both contribute 30% of their take home income to the joint account. Right. That way, um, instead of, you know, contributing exactly equal amounts, which would leave one spouse with, you know, one spouse with a whole lot less money of spending money than the other spouse, you kind of contribute pro rata or proportionally to the joint account according to your incomes. And that's how things kind of remain fair and each spouse still retains their own separate money. Uh, and if you worked hard and you've got a good income, then you can still benefit from that if that's how you know you and your spouse agree to handle your finances. But you're both, you know, contributing and you both have a say, you know, on those on those joint expenses. Um, so those are, you know, just a couple, you know, variations of ways that that couples can set up their money bucket so there's money going to the joint account but each spouse still has their own you know money to do with what they want just um you know because this isn't going to be a ridiculous question but <laughs> let's just do it uh which one do you think uh which one do you see more frequently and which one um i can see tons of issues with the outside in already um however with with a lot of like uh the way that we do it is like we have a lot of automatic allocation set up. So 
like all of the budgeting retirement accounts. Like I just, you know, the, before it even, like it doesn't even hit an account and then it's already allocated where it's going. Right. So that's a decision made pre paycheck. Um, but that's a systemic, that's an implementation detail that has nothing to do with, with either of these plans, which one do you see more frequently, the inside out or the outside in? Um, I see the outside in more frequently, um, oh, even though, um, you know, my wife and I do um, the inside out. So for whatever you want to take that from, I think then this is my theory on why, why that is. Um, I think that couples who their tendency would be to just keep everything separate. It is a slower merging of their financial lives to do an outside in. You know, I find that those couples, when they have shared expenses, are typically going from like, well, I'll just Venmo you my share of dinner or I'll just cash app you my share of the mortgage. Um, mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> to take a couple from that to a system where at least they have a joint account where their joint expenses are coming out of it and they can both see how much money is going in and how much is coming out is a massive improvement over people who are you know, living these financial, these, you know, totally separate financial lives, even though they're married or what I'll sometimes right. call going Dutch for life, you know, yeah, going, going Dutch, Dutch for, for life, life doesn't work, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, yeah. by the way. Um, and so, and then there are couples who maybe they're a little bit more traditional and like, you know, you know, my parents' generation, their tendency was to have one bank account. And all of the money goes in that one bank account and everything comes out of that one bank account. So if that's mm -hmm. your kind of set point, then it may make more sense to you to do the inside out plan where all the money comes into one bank account and then you need to kind of get your own little allowance that comes mm -hmm. off of the top of that. I think the inside out plan is also easier for doing joint investments. You know, if you've got like a joint right. brokerage account where, you know, yep. both spouses can see how much is going in there. Um, and you're right, the outside in plan, I think, takes more work because you still got to be careful that you don't end up with, you know, these huge inequities that can grow the more disparity in the spouse's incomes there are, the more, you know, kind of trouble they can have um, and the more you can kind of get into, you know, some unhealthy power dynamics. But um, I think the, a lot of that can be uh, mitigated by the annual conversation of laying everything there. It, it's a, I think it's a particularly tricky conversation. And this, this data point is, is, is less interesting to, uh, feel good fathers specifically, but it, it's still interesting. So women by and large on a 5,000 sample UK study were more attracted to a man who earned 50% more than they did. So if she earned 60, they were more attracted to a man who earned 90. And in fact, it was usually, it wasn't even a, like attraction is a light word as in it was a, he had better be earning at least 80 to even get a date. Like, oh, wow. you know, like this is hard line <laughs> point reference in psychology today. And so, you know, we've talked about some of the negative consequences of not having communication, of not setting yourself up correctly, but spouses are by and large at default, generally entering these relationships at a power, to, a, a power differential with regards to finances. In general, it's very rare uh, for the, the couples to be at equity as far as like what they're both earning. Like it's not very common for um, her to pick if she's earning 200 for her to pick a mate who also earns 200. That is, that is not common at all. And in general, it's, it's usually like she is either down here and he's up there. Um, and then because there's some, um, there is some data on uh, the other side of that, that in general, if she is earning more than him, uh, it, it's not a pretty picture um, as far as like his ability to handle that. And there's, there's a lot of, right. um, actually, it's not all on him. There's, there's data here. I don't want to get into it. If you're interested, please do some research. It's compelling. It's crazy. And go to a reputable source. Don't, don't go to some random blog, look at some scientific papers, find some doctors, psychologists, and uh, you know, professors that are actually doing this research. Um, it's interesting. Um, and so it's interesting for you feel good father and for your spouse, because there are these tendencies, 
And so it's very interesting to understand, you know, when you talk about power dynamics, it can be something that's not intended. You're not intending to lord over or do something else, but it can feel that way. And um, in the same way that with verbal communication, the vast majority, more than 60% of what's actually communicated is in your tone and your body language, financial communication can result in the same kind of thing. It can create feeling. Uh, that's, that's the way the cookie crumbles, <laughs> so to speak. Sure, sure. Um, Aaron, this has been fantastic. Thank you for dropping this incredible knowledge on us. Uh, I, you know, I learned tons of stuff. Uh, the show notes are going to be really great. We, we have referenced so much stuff. There will be things down there in there for you. Uh, feel good father to listen to. If they want to find out more about you, what you're about, get involved, learn about, you know, what, you, what's, what's on offer, where can they go and what can they do? Come check us out at prenups.com. Um, we've got uh, videos on there. Um, we've got a free ebook on there. We're adding more resources all the time. So prenups.com spelled just like it sounds. Got it. And the link will be in the show notes. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. All right, folks, you're going to hit the subscribe button up there, or you can go down into the description and you can subscribe down there as well. Oh, thanks, Aaron. Oh, and by the way, oh, oh, goodness. I think, I think it showed up here. This is a video. It's a feel good fatherhood video. Not sure which one, but UTEP has decided that it is the next one that you should watch. So go ahead and click the thing. It'll be really fun. You'll like it. It's a good conversation. Okay.